Welcome to Learning with Sprayberry, where we make social studies fun, easy, and educational. This mini-series is focusing on the causes of the Civil War. We're going to break it down into a multi-part series, so make sure you check out the rest of it to give you a good idea of the road to war. Today, we're going to focus on John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia. So let's dive in. Smart observers will ask, who is John Brown and why should I care? Let's start with the who question. John Brown was a fierce abolitionist. He was strictly against slavery. He was raised in a religious household and later opened a tannery which had a hidden room to help hide slaves escaping on the Underground Railroad. It actually served as a major passage for the Underground Railroad from 1825 to 1835. In 1837, John Brown heard about the death of Elijah P. Lovejoy, an anti-slavery minister who was killed by a pro-slavery mob in Illinois. In response to Lovejoy's death, Brown declared, Here, before God, in the presence of these witnesses from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. A few years later, 1846 marked a change for Brown. He moved to Springfield, Massachusetts. And this town was relatively unique at the time because it was progressive due to the fact that the town's white leadership was heavily involved in the anti-slavery movement. While living in Springfield, Brown saw both Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth speak at Sanford Street Free Church, a church run by black abolitionists in Springfield. 1855 led Brown to move to Kansas. The introduction of popular sovereignty with the Kansas-Nebraska Act led to the influx of pro- and anti-slavery forces into Kansas, which naturally led to conflict. Brown heard from his sons that abolitionists living in Kansas were woefully underprepared for violent pro-slavery forces. Brown's abolitionist leanings turned violent when he and a group of abolitionists pulled five slave catchers from their homes and killed them with swords. Let's fast forward to 1859. Brown had not slowed down with his abolitionist push. By the way, we're moving into the why I should care part of the video. Brown moved to a small rental farm near Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Because Brown had caused quite a ruckus in Kansas by killing slave catchers, he was living in Virginia under a pseudonym, Isaac Smith. In this rental farm, he had with him 18 men where they hatched plans to take the U.S. Armory at Harper's Ferry. While hiding out at this farm, Brown tried to recruit local slaves to help him with the armory attack hoping to begin a slave revolt that would eventually end slavery. Brown even tried to get Frederick Douglass to support his plan. Douglass later wrote, An attack on the federal government would array the whole country against us. You will never get out of this alive. Needless to say, Douglass did not support his plan. Fun fact, because of the number of men at the farm would look suspicious, the men hid during the day leaving Brown's daughters as lookouts. Brown wanted this plan to go as smoothly as possible, so he hired Hugh Forbes to train himself and the men. Unfortunately, Forbes and Brown disagreed on the payment, and Forbes threatened to expose Brown. Forbes even went to Washington, D.C. and warned U.S. Senators that Brown was a dangerous abolitionist. But he didn't expose the whole plan. The Senators didn't take him seriously. Forbes' warning wasn't the only heads up the government got. David Yu, a Quaker, worried about Brown dying in the raid, actually went to the Secretary of War John Floyd and told him the plan. But Floyd didn't make the connection that this was the same Brown who was involved in bleeding Kansas. Now let's jump ahead and hit the raid. On October 16, 1859, Brown took 14 men to Harper's Ferry. The group split into two. One group went to capture Lewis Washington, George Washington's grand nephew, and the other group moved on to Harper's Ferry. On the way, Brown captured hostages, cut the telegraph lines, and stopped a train heading to Washington, D.C. to prevent them from warning Washington. Oddly enough, though, Brown released the train. In total, Brown had hoped to recruit a thousand slaves. In reality, he got less than 30 people to help him. The very next day, Brown and his group were discovered. Local farmers, militia, and merchants surrounded the armory. To prevent his escape, the militia cut the raiders off from the local river. In the initial attack, four townspeople were killed. Brown and his group were driven further into the base, and they ended up holding up in the engine house on the armory ground. It was decided that the group should surrender. He sent out a member of his group who was unfortunately shot and killed. A later attack by the militia was slightly successful. They ended up rescuing 12 hostages, and only eight militiamen were wounded. President James Buchanan, upon hearing of the attack, 
ordered the Marines under the command of Robert E. Lee to attack the armory. October 18, 1859 proved to be the end of Brown's plans. Brown unsuccessfully attempted another negotiation, but upon hearing the terms, he refused. The Marines tried to break down the engine room door, which didn't work, so they switched to using a ladder as a battering ram. Once breaking in, Brown was wounded and captured by the Marines, which ended his plans at a slave revolt. In the aftermath of the raid, the country was forced into facing slavery head on. Abolitionist forces thought of Brown as a martyr who was willing to die for his beliefs and the epitome of the cause. Southerners instead saw Brown as an eccentric northerner who was putting his nose where it didn't belong. His raids further fueled fear that slaves were being actively recruited to escape and fight back. Some historians have argued that his raid and subsequent trial changed the direction of the presidential election. Pushing slavery into the spotlight forced presidential candidates to address the issue head on. Brown was put on trial for treason, murder, and conspiring with Negroes to produce insurrection. Each of these charges, if he was found guilty, would carry the death penalty. On October 26, 1859, in Charlestown, Virginia, Brown was put on trial. Six days later, November 2nd, Brown was convicted of treason. While being led to the gallows, Brown handed a letter to his guard, and the letter eerily foreshadowed the path of the U.S. I, John Brown, am quite certain that the crimes of this land will never be purged away but with blood. At 11.15 on December 2nd, Brown was led up to the gallows where he gave his last words to the executioner. Don't keep me waiting longer than necessary. Be quick. Question of the day. While Brown's goal of ending slavery was admirable, do you think his willingness to resort to violence helped or hindered his goal? Let me know down in the comments below. Time for subscriber of the week. Thanks to AK Pluto for subscribing. I really appreciate it. If you want to be featured as a subscriber of the week, all you got to do is subscribe. It's really easy, actually. If you liked what you saw, click like. If you want to see more content, click subscribe. Make sure you ring that bell to get notified every time I drop content. Thanks for watching Learning with Sprayberry, where we make social studies fun easy, and educational. See you next time.